Right now, the day's biggest news stories from a Vegas perspective. This is the Vegas Take with Sharp and Shapiro. All right, welcome back. It is the Vegas Take, uh, hour number three. So glad you could join us. By the way, a reminder, we are broadcasting live on YouTube. It is the Vegas Take, also the Vegas Take Facebook page, our website, the Vegas Take. Check us out. You can see our pretty mugs right now, uh, although I do, I have been told before I do have a face for radio. Anyway, we're going to get into uh, this Kobe Bryant stuff. Uh, joining us in studio right now, he is a former college basketball national coach of the year. He's won at pretty much every single program he's uh, been a head coach at, and uh, he lives here in Las Vegas now. Uh, Larry Eustacey joining us on pretty, the program. Pretty much. I've won at every program. <laughs> you have. You have. Yes. That is <laughs> Come true. on, Brian. Do your homework. <laughs> Even as an assistant coach? <laughs> have you ever been an assistant coach at a losing program? Uh, no. Maybe. That's I, don't, incredible. I can't remember. So uh, before we get to the Kobe Bryant <clears throat> stuff, we were talking off the air a little bit about the political stuff and talk to me a little bit about your thoughts. Just, I'm just curious how your mind works, your thoughts on this impeachment trial. Uh, do you agree with JD that, uh, you know, there's no chance he's going to be out of office and witnesses sh- sh- probably shouldn't testify. Or do you agree with me where I say witnesses should testify and we just want to get down to the truth? Like what's your, what First are your thoughts? Brian, I did not say that witnesses should not testify. I did not say that. I thought you did. No, I thought you I agreed not, with Republicans because I believe that, if witnesses do testify, then Hunter Biden will testify, and, but that if, will be, and that will be a giant victory for the Republicans because he is not a very smart guy. But if Bolton testifies, you agree that Madonna should testify and every uh, liberal should testify? I mean, someone, you know, assuming they're relevant to the conversation, Madonna is absolutely <laughs> how not about, relevant how about, to the conversation. How about Hillary Clinton? Should she testify? Neither should Mike Lindell. He shouldn't testify. Should either. Hillary or, Clinton or, testify? Or Ocasio-Cortez. Should Hillary Clinton testify about her emails? That could be a conversation. And you think that's relevant I, to this case? I think that would be irrelevant. But okay. that could happen. That, right. I wouldn't be shocked if right. she was called right. up to testify. All right. Well, Larry, what do you think? Well, from a guy that basically lived in a coma for 30 years coaching <laughs> basketball, and, and I'm ashamed to say I've never voted, but I have taken an interest the last couple of years. And I, I just find the hypocrisy from both sides just, uh, you know, insulting. Is a good word. It's mm-hmm. just insulting, you know. I I don't. I think the guy like me sitting on the curb, standing up, we're not paying any attention to this. We mm-hmm. we really aren't. Now I'm sure there are um, those that are, but we want to move this country forward. And we know, you know, I'm I like things about Donald Trump. Uh, I can't stand what he tweets with about people and how he puts people down and handicaps and those type of things, but. Um, you talk about him draining the swamp. I mean, I, I, I've never, I don't think the swamp's ever been exposed more. Would you agree or disagree in the, since he's been president mm-hmm. in the history of this country? Well, I agree. I think the swamp's been there since I've been alive. No I'm 39 years old. I don't think he's certainly helped in that category. In fact, you can make the argument he's made it worse. I agree. Uh, but uh, I don't want to get JD upset anymore, so I guess we'll move well, on. Well, let's to get JD story. upset. I, I think up. he jumped right in the swamp and yeah. and found out what it was like. Trump first of all, first swampy. of all, I really believe he 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 ran for office, as Howard Stern would say, just for a publicity stunt. And then he yeah. got some traction. All of a sudden, he's president. And, yeah. and um, I mean, we all know who Donald Trump is. I mean, he, sadly, yeah. Well, not sadly, but but he is. An egomaniac, he, he narcissist. He, but there's things that he's doing that's very well for this country too. Mm-hmm. You can take it from both sides. I think the people are just tired of this bickering and back and forth and the insulting of a guy with very average intelligence that's talking right now. I'm being insulted, and my IQ <laughs> is not nearly. Uh, what the average person is, it's extremely low. So if I'm insulted, I would <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> I would think that the that the rest of the country is somewhat insulted. Well, first of all, I disagree with that. I think you are a very smart guy, uh, and if you don't know who that is, he's former national college basketball coach of the year, Larry Eustacey, now turned political analyst. Uh, you have a future in politics, Larry. You should run. Well, I would just I would go right to my <laughs> friend Tarkanian and ask him how not Danny. to do it. Go to Danny and say Danny struggled how, a little. Bit. Danny's the greatest. He's a great friend. He's a great. He's guy. a good dude, but he has not had a very uh, yeah, he's, good career in politics. He's, he's had a poor track record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
and uh, <laughs> um, uh, timing. You know, had he run when his dad was running this town. But Larry, as a friend of Danny's, I have to ask you this. I don't know Danny extremely well. But, but let me ask you this. Your father is the late, great Jerry Tarkanian, a hero in this town, always has been. How the hell does his son not get elected? How does that happen? I don't understand it. He's just put his name on the ballot and he should win. I'm just saying. He's Danny Tarkanian. He's Jerry's son. That's the part I don't understand. Well, you know, you get into his father, and his father is, uh, you know, they have this pyramid of success about a guy named John Wooden who cheated far more than Jerry Tarkanian ever did. Um, I think Jerry Tarkanian probably is the greatest ever coach college basketball. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he... Certainly one of the best. You can't argue that. Well, no, I mean, I, I yeah. argue with what he... With the hand he was dealt. Yeah, everybody was against um, him. The, you know, when he moved to... Mm-hmm. When he took the Fresno job, the NCAA basically set up a, a an office there so he could have no success. I mean, they just constantly went after him. And, uh, and, and look what's going on. Look what's being exposed right now. I mean, these massive schemes of... of how to get these players into school. And Tark was no part of that. He yeah. never, I know for a fact, I coached against him. He was a great friend. Yeah, he might bring a kid in and and and, and help him, you know, with, with an apartment payment or those what, type what of things. What top we coaches all, today are not doing stuff we like all, that? We all did that. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You know, I mean, we all, as a parent dies, you can't, you can't get him back to his family. Yeah. You, you do that. But there mm-hmm. were no... Hey, come here and you get a hundred thousand dollars from Jerry. That 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 never happened. There's Not no question like what that we're reading about. Jerry got absolutely screwed and hosed at UNLV. He brought UNLV a national championship. He put them on the map. Uh, I I know guys uh, that I talk to on a regular basis. Guys like Anderson Hunt, who I'm friends with. Uh, the stories with Jerry and how he was a father figure to Anderson. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of, I'm sure you would agree. There are some phony coaches out there. They pretend like they care about their kids when, uh, and most of them do, but some of them don't. I'm sure you would agree with that. Jerry was not that guy. He truly, from the players that played for him, they all tell me the same thing. He truly cared about his players like they were family. Well, Tim Floyd, who many may not know, but a very successful college coach, coach Mm -hmm. Chicago Bulls was at USC is my best friend and him. Tim and myself both basically stole Tark's pattern for success, if you will. There's probably a better way to put it, but mm-hmm. you know, we took the transfers, we took the kids that were we. I, I love the kids that that had no chance. It's like why San Diego State's a top five team in the country. Look at all the great transfers they have. Well, and yeah. and more importantly, you know, um, he doesn't know who his father is. Um, it, his mom has drug problems and. And it's so much fun when the parents aren't involved and you're able to mold mm-hmm. a, another son. And Jerry's had hundreds of sons. Mm-hmm. You know, he did. They all – what's interesting is you, you've never heard anybody rat Jerry Tarkanian out, not one player. Right. Not one loyalty. player. They're all loyal but, Yeah, because yeah. he – you know, a player knows when you care about him and when you're using him. And, yeah. and he certainly cared about him. Since we're on the, the topic of caring, um, obviously – uh, I spoke with you briefly when the news broke out that, that Kobe Bryant had lost his life. And then we learned his 13-year-old daughter was on that chopper, which is even worse. Um, before I get to some of the personal stories that you're going to share with us, with, with a player that, that you coached, um, what was your initial reaction when you when you heard about Kobe? Well, I, I you know, I, I'll always remember where I was in my house, so on the couch, et cetera, but I remember when JFK was shot. I remember 9-11, and I remember when Magic announced that he had AIDS. And this will be the fourth that I will always remember where I was at that time. Mm-hmm. But in coming here, you know, I, I came up the elevator, and here's a bunch of young kids running around doing something in this in this studio. Mm-hmm. And uh, the way I correlate it is when I was the head coach at Iowa State, I, uh, I would get in our van, I'd my son would jump in, 11, 12, 13 years old. We'd pick up a parent and a player. By the way, one of them was Harrison Barnes. Um, we'd pick up another parent and another player. And uh, and I really relate to what happened because basically they got in his car, right. which is a helicopter. And, you know, the, what, what's the sadness is the children. I mean, if, yeah. 
you know, it's like, so we get in this car and Harrison Barnes is in it, my child's in it, and, and, and we get hit by a semi. Right. It, it, That's know, what gets me too. Very correlated. It, yeah. it, you know, we're talking about Kobe and his daughter, and, and, and I think it should be more about the children and his daughter. I mean, I think everybody deep down really mm-hmm. knows that. Mm-hmm. But but what a legacy and what a, what a great career to follow in, in, mm-hmm. in Kobe. I wanted you to share a story with us because we're, we're hearing a lot of stories of, of some of the things that Kobe Bryant did off the court, which I think need to be told. Sadly, they're told, you know, after he loses his life. But I think we all know what a great person Kobe was as a father, husband, and all the great things he did for women's basketball, promoting the WNBA. But you're, you were coaching at Colorado State, and I want you to tell this story, but you had a kid on your team who lost several members of his family in a, in a fire. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about this story and how give me the backstory on and then how Kobe was involved? Well, we had a, a terrific player named Emmanuel Obongo. And uh, uh, tragically, with an electrical malfunction out of Baltimore, his parents, who were immigrants and hard, extremely hard workers, uh, had a house full of children in part of his a couple sisters and a fire broke out and everybody got out but his two parents and a young niece and Emmanuel actually we played that night and Emmanuel chose to play so he loses his niece and both of his parents hours earlier and then he decides to play I mean how did he even perform? you know I, I want I want to step back so I think it was the next day we played and this is where Kobe comes into play is uh now who would do this who really would do this Kobe Bryant took the time to send him a personal video with his condolences and it wasn't like my you know here sorry goodbye it was 15 20 minutes of here's how you here's how you deal with it here's how you oh and gosh. I think that really gave Emmanuel the strength to step forward and and move forward and I don't think Emmanuel obviously will ever forget that and neither will I. That's incredible. So he didn't he, they had never met before. Never met. He, Kobe obviously heard about the story. He had read it somewhere, or heard from somebody. So what does he do? Does he like contact your university? I at? have no clue, but obviously he, he had his people who could and and all of a sudden Emmanuel looks on his on his phone and here is a video personally from Kobe just to him one on one. Were were you, you able know? to watch it? I, I didn't want to. Yeah. It was very personal. personal. Yeah. yeah, it was very personal. But Emmanuel, you know, was crying um, immensely after, and and it, it was cries of strength. It gave him strength, and that's the type of person that I mean, nobody else did. And listen, I don't want to, I don't want to talk trash about some of the games greats, but I've never heard of a story of, and Michael Jordan's done some good things in his life. There's no question, but I've never heard a story of Michael Jordan doing something like that. Have you? I, you know, I like I said, I've been in a coma for 30 years and finally got out after coaching. But um, it was pretty unique. Very unique. For me. Doesn't that speak volumes about the type of person Kobe was? I hate to say was. I still can't believe I have to say that. But, I mean, I remember Larry covering USA Basketball here. And he would sign autographs for all the kids, take pictures. But he didn't just do that. And again, this was Kobe Bryant, one of the most recognizable people on the planet, right? He didn't just sign a quick autograph or take a picture. If he was talking with kids, he would actually get involved in asking them about their life, about basketball, where do they go to school. Like, I actually saw him engage with kids, and all the kids wanted was an autographer to shake his hand, you know? That's the kind of guy he was. He, he took the time to, to actually talk to people. And I think we're missing that today when the age of social media, people don't interact with one another. Kobe was an interactor. He was a people person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think then I think what Kobe would, you know, this is where your faith is really tested. I think Kobe would like to see more attention put on the potential of the young children in that helicopter than on him. But I got to witness Kobe Bryant in when he played in 1995 at the Adidas camp and it was really the heir of the first entourage. He walked out and he was 17 years old and he had 
all these people around him, and I'll never forget that. It was it was breathtaking. And I, I, I think, to make a long story short, Kobe was a storyteller. And I think, in a way, God chose to basically follow him on video his whole life and, and tell his story from his, you know, from a young age to breaking a culture of being successful in the NBA right out of high school mm -hmm. to making mistakes to getting back on track to to just, I mean, face it. You know, I, I'm not a fan of this room I'm sitting in. I love the guys in it, but I'm not a media guy. <laughs> they, they have not been awfully kind to me. But, that is true. A lot of people but, have been very unfair to you. But But that's part of it. And Kobe was undressed in front of it on a daily basis and what a great story of of and a role model of of how to live and how to overcome and 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 how to respond and and um he was the best worst shot take maker <laughs> he did take a lot of tough shots no i mean he he yeah. was he was special and that's why it hit home so hard can i you ask know, you though going back to you saw kobe not a lot of people can say they saw Kobe play in person when he was a teenager. You were one of those people. What did you? Were, I know you talk about you know his entourage and his demeanor and all, but what did you see from him as a basketball purist? What did you see from him on the court when you watched him that just blew your mind? Like, what do you remember? Well, at that time, he should have been a center with his the length of his arms and his at 17, size at yeah. 17. Mm -hmm. But he was a point guard who had a first step and explosive like nobody you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And and flat out, nobody was more competitive than Kobe Bryant. You know, you may be some equals, but nobody competed harder than him at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And I actually sat on the sidelines, <clears throat> excuse me, where when he played that rookie year, I was right on the floor when they played the Utah Jazz and he shot those four air balls. And uh, like I say, that that's that I think God chose to expose him and show his story. And boy, I love the way he handled it. Um, he was put in a very tough situation. If you remember, mm -hmm. Byron Scott got hurt. Mm -hmm. There was a fight that broke out. And so Kobe had to take the game winning shot in the, in the fourth quarter and airballed it. So it went to overtime. They were playing the Utah Jazz in the quarters. But what you just told me. Uh, and you tell me if you disagree or not. Uh, we all know LeBron's going to go down as one of the best to ever play the game. And I don't like to make comparisons too much, but I'm going to make one here. It seemed like, and you tell me if you agree or not, it seemed like with Kobe, he was not afraid to be that guy. He wanted the ball in his hands with 10 seconds to go. He Even at a young age, he, he bared the, prop, the responsibility of it. It appeared to me in the first 10 years of LeBron James' career, he never felt comfortable being that guy. He didn't have that killer instinct, and not many did that a guy like Kobe Bryant had, or Michael Jordan, or Larry Bird. Now, I'm naming arguably three of the best players to ever play the game, but those are the guys that had like that killer mentality. And I think LeBron has that now, but I don't think I don't like it when people make the comparisons between LeBron and Kobe because I don't think LeBron had that killer mentality when he was in the league, and I, and I think Kobe did. Well, I, I, you know, I, I would say that LeBron, I, I would say that Kobe in that situation I just described didn't feel comfortable taking really? those shots. No, yeah. he was forced in a tough situation and mm -hmm. should never have been in it. And it could have broken lesser men, but it made him work harder. So I get that 17, 18 years old, all those guys, I don't, to put in, a, in the semis of an NBA playoff game and you have to be the guy, I don't know who was successful out of all the guys you mentioned. But it seemed like in, in Kobe's 20s, most of his 20s, he, he, had, he, he had that killer instinct. It was just natural to him. I'm just not sure LeBron had that the first 10 years of his career. I'm not talking about maybe the first couple of years. That's just my opinion. I just think Kobe was a natural at, at, at being that killer. Uh, that, and, and listen, LeBron, like I said, LeBron's going to go down as one of the best to ever play the game as well. I just don't like the comparisons, that's all. Yeah, I think it's really tough to compare A to B. And you're, you're talking about, you'd Different. have an argument either way for all of them. True. I mean, there's, there's just Jordan's a, the best of all time, though, right? I would. This is where I go back at. LeBron's pretty good. So you and think you he's in the conversation between Michael I, and LeBron? I think as far as impact on winning, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't ever say somebody's better than Jordan, mm -hmm. but I could say some. Larry Bird was right there. I don't, a lot of equals. Uh, Not I, a lot of equals. I don't mean to put you on the few. spot, but 
if I had to give you a top five, what is Larry Eustacey's top five basketball players of all time? I would have uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at post. I would have uh, the three guys we just mentioned, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here's where it gets tricky. Who plays the one? Any of them. I just put Magic. Magic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that, I, I would have Magic and, magic and, at the and one, Bird Col- at magic the four. At, yeah. And, and the two, and Jordan and So it would be Kobe. Magic, Kobe, your two guards. Jordan would play the three, I would imagine. Yeah, and you play small ball only. They're all seven feet tall. Who would be the four? <laughs> the four would be Bird. So Bird, you'd have Bird at the four and Kareem yeah. at the five. I think that's a pretty good team. Did you did you see any of those USA basketball practices? By, by the way, back in the day, the Dream Team. Yeah, I did. Oh my God, what was that yeah. like? Well, I Charles Barkley and I uh, met in a very strange way and have uh, had a great relationship. Uh, but I I just I really keyed on Charles, and he was quite. The, I mean, he really overtook the whole Dream Team. And that I was mean, when Bird had the back problems, right? Bird it wasn't had the healthy. back problem, yeah. and uh, so you saw some of those practices. Yeah. Oh, and, I'm so jealous. And of that. Barkley was Charles was out to prove that 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 you know he's just not a toss in. Mm-hmm. And he actually, I think he led the team in scoring. And and they had a blast. They 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 brought out a bowling ball one time because Charles had a band aid on his head. He had a little <laughs> cut, so they brought out a bowling ball and put a band aid on it. I mean, those guys, you know, because his head that, 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 oh, that hurts your head, Charles. Pick it up. I mean, those guys. Jordan was as good as anybody at a prankster. I mean, they 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 had a blast. they messed with each other. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, they really did. They had a lot of fun. And but when it came time to represent our country, yeah, it was all business. I'll tell you what I want to do. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, you'd be able to stick around for one more segment with us. Is yeah. that cool? I appreciate it. Uh, lunch is on me, by the way. We'll take a quick break. Uh, we're well, here. Okay. Can we get? Can I get tape of that? Right there. Can I get <laughs> me, that part of me, this? Me yeah. taking the bill. It doesn't. JD, I'll buy you lunch today too, because I know you're angry at me. Okay. That's Stein, fine, Brian. Stein's going to have to pay Actually, for his own I've, lunch. I've I refuse a, to pay for anything I've for Stein. I've got to look at house in a while, so I can't do that. <laughs> okay, well, I'm offering. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. Joining us in studio, he's the former National College Basketball Coach of the Year, Larry Eustacey. I want to talk a little bit more Kobe with him, and I want to ask him, what does it mean for basketball, his legacy left behind? We'll talk to Larry about that coming up next. We'll take a quick break. You are listening to The Vegas Take right here on the all-new 101.5 FM, 720 AM, KDOM. All right, welcome back. It is the Vegas Take Sharp and Shapiro. Glad you could join us on a Tuesday and uh, obviously talking about uh, talking some hoops, talking about the tragic death of Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter and, of course, the seven others who lost their lives, who we have to remember, uh, on that uh, helicopter crash that took place early Sunday morning. You know, we were driving to the UNLV game, the UNLV San Diego State game. And, by the way, joining us in studio, former National College Basketball Coach of the Year, Larry Eustacey. We were driving to the uh, San Diego State game, UNLV, and uh, they had a moment of silence there. Um, so if somebody asked you, Larry, after a game or whatever, and said, uh, you know, what type of legacy does Kobe Bryant leave behind, both on and off the court, how, how would you answer that? I think, I believe he leaves a legacy uh, that is second to none. I really do. I, I think what he was doing off the court, um, he was able to leave that the game, which has have been hard for me to do. Yeah. He was able to put that game in the rearview mirror mm-hmm. and move on. And what he did during the time in the game, I mean, nobody worked harder. Nobody rehabbed more. Nobody dedicated himself to the game. I mean, I, I if you take total package, tell me somebody that was a better – he had his mm-hmm. – Demons, he had his faults. I mean, I get that. Let's not discount that. But I think that's where I go back to. He was, he was stripped, and everybody got to watch him. You'll go through this life, and who's who's done a better job of it? Name somebody. You've talked a lot in your career about you know mental toughness and how important that is. And you know there are some teammates, former teammates of Kobe Bryant. They didn't like playing with him. In fact, there were some guys in the league that said they would never play with Kobe Bryant. And then you got guys like Derek Fisher, some of his teammates that said, what's wrong with demanding 150%? What's wrong with doing the things necessary to win? Some players, they just couldn't handle that. And that's why they didn't want to play with the guy. And, you know, some of the speculation between Shaquille O'Neal, we all know Shaq, one of the greatest of all time. 
And he's going through a tough time right now, too, because they had their differences as players and their relationship improved after uh, they both retired. But, you know, a lot of people say that's the reason why Shaq and Kobe didn't always get along, uh, because Kobe demanded so much of Shaq and their stories. And in a book I read where, you know, Kobe was faulting Shaq for not being in good physical shape and not being ready in training camp. And they got into it and almost got into a fist fight because of that. Um, there are two different types of players, right? Guys that wanted to play with Kobe, that wanted that push to be a better player and to win, and then the other type of player that wanted to do their own thing and, and didn't want that type of demand. W- would you agree with that? Yeah, I look at it from the coaching side, and I you, know, you won't find a coach that wouldn't want to coach him. Yeah. You may find some players that didn't want to play with him, and those are the players you don't want anyway. You want guys that – that give you 150 percent right and when you have a guy like kobe he's basically the lebron's the same way a lot of guys don't like to play with lebron because he's so demanding but in a right way right i but, think that's fair but, yeah. but did kobe respect the head coach position because i don't think that lebron james does respect that the head coaching position that's a good point that's a great point yeah i uh it goes all the way back to magic did magic when he got paul westhead fired i don't know if you remember that story i do i do magic got in his, his little Tiff and and all of a sudden Paul Westhead is no yeah. longer the coach. Uh, I think the pain. I mean, it, I, I've always told our players that you know I, I'm gonna I'm not gonna demand respect. I'm gonna earn your respect. And I think somebody like Phil Jackson definitely earned the respect of Kobe. But Bryant. isn't it interesting though? Because we had Jeff. I know he's a friend of yours. Jeff Van Gundy was on our show a few months ago, and he said when he was coaching the New York Knicks, Patrick Ewing didn't necessarily respect him. You remember this, J.D.? But he said Patrick Ewing respected the coaching position. Right. And that's why they had an okay relationship. Didn't need to respect him, but just respect the coaching position. I agree with J.D. in this sense. Uh, you know, and there's Dwight Howard, you know, got Stan Van Gundy fired, fired. In this day and age, I do believe LeBron has had coaches lose their job. Who's the coach who coached the Cleveland Cavaliers, who, who coached in Europe? I, I, I'm, I'm uh, George to, Carl? Mike Brown? Uh, no, the, the guy who did the Israel, uh, he coached the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, yeah, I can think of his I, name. I, I, I know who you're talking about. For the life about. of me, I, I, I can't, can't, think, of I can't name, think of the guy's name. But that guy was there right. for a, a year or two and, and got to the NBA Finals, and LeBron just didn't get along with him. Right. LeBron didn't like him. Um, do you think that's fair? David Blatt. David, David Blatt. Blatt. Thank yep. you. Yeah. But there's a perfect situation. I don't know how great of a coach he, he, he is for MB, for the NBA. They went to the NBA Finals, and then he's gone, and, and the speculation is, is that LeBron had a lot to do with that. What do you make of that? Well, personally, you know, the, yeah, you, you, you respect a position okay, but I, I, I think it's more – I disagree with Jeff Van Gundy. I think it's the person in that position. And that person has to earn its respect. I was taught a long time ago that when I walked into a new office with a new team, I earned the respect of the secretary, from the janitor, to everybody in between. And um, so more so not the position, just the person that's in that position. Does that make sense? Yes. No, it does make sense. So you think that... You know, for whatever reason, Van Gundy didn't gain the respect of Ewing, and you know that we don't know why. And you're saying that there are certain coaches out there, like a Larry Brown. Do you still think? And I know you're friends with with Larry as well. Do you still think that you know Allen Iverson never respected Larry Brown, or Allen Iverson just is the type of guy that just wouldn't respect any coach? What did you make of that player coach scenario? Because that had to be a nightmare to coach Allen Iverson. Well, first of all, with Jeff, I I think Jeff would I. I'd like next time I talk to him, I'd like to ask him what what he really believes in that because mm-hmm. I think it's the person in the spot. But but Alan was, you know, Alan was a whole different breed. Larry said that he would uh, mf if he might two times a game. He would do that to Larry, and it was every time he took him out, he would call him an mf. Yeah, he would wow. mf him. That is and, unbelievable. And, and, it shows you, but it, it goes to today's era even then. I mean, when you've got a player like that and he can win and you you learn how to coexist, you, yeah. you just do learn how to. But Alan had a lot of things going on. A lot of demons. Off the and court. now he's broke. Yeah. But we, we've had conversations off, off air before. And I think that one thing that separates a college coach from a professional coach is a professional coach is more of a player manager, whereas a college coach is a player development, you know, more involved in player development. And you always prefer to coach the college level as opposed to the NBA level. Why is that? Well, I, you know, I, I coached a professional team in uh, 
when I was the Bahamas national coach, and I actually enjoyed that because you're dealing with professionals. Uh, you know, they're, they're paid to show up and be there on time. Uh, so this, it, it's kind of double-edged sword. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with the Utah Jazz and watched what Quinn Snyder's just done a fabulous job. And I'm not jumping on the bad wagon because I've been up there for two years now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I think it's always been about managing players. Mm-hmm. Uh it's just, you know, these guys become adults. You're dealing with young young brains that aren't developed. Right. That you have to be more stern with and, mm-hmm. and more direct with. And with the adult, you treat like an adult. And I always told our players in college, you act like an adult, I'll treat you like an adult. If you act like a young a kid, i got to treat you like a kid. So what is it like when you go into these days, right? Because you're an old school guy. You go into, a, let's say, a Bishop Gorman practice, and you see these 16, 17, 18-year-old kids that think their you-know-what doesn't stink, and they have they cop this attitude like they're the greatest in the world and they haven't even lived life yet. What do you make that a guy like you, an old school guy who's been around the game so long, when you walk into a gym like that and you see the way these kids are today? Some of them, not all of them. Well, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't look as myself as an old school guy. I, I think I've always stayed up with the times. And uh, I, I, I think whether it's high school, whether it's college, or whether it's the uh, professional level, it really starts with the management. It starts with the owner of a team, the president of a team. It starts with the athletic director. It starts with you know what kind of backing you get from those people as to how you can, you know, deal with your players but i will go on record saying i you know who is the abuser at colorado state and i'll leave it at that i mean to, to some of the things that that you have to put up with with these parents and these kids these days is what you're getting into you know victims raising victims is what i call it it's I mean, it's a different era right it, you can't it's almost like you can't be yourself and you can't hold kids accountable you said something to me once that made a lot of sense to me you said you know you're coaching these these 12 kids you, you have to make sure that they're a little bit uncomfortable to get their 100% out there on the floor because the second they're way too comfortable, they think they can do whatever they want to do. Yeah, you have to sweat. You right. have to get tired. You have to yeah. do things that are uncomfortable, and you put them in situations that are even tougher than the game, and that was always our, how we tried to do things. Right. Now, speaking of sweating and being tired and uncomfortable, going back to Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant had arguably you know, a, a legendary work ethic. Do you have any stories that, that you could tell us, tell us of, his, of his work ethic that you heard of? You know, I, I don't, but uh, I've heard them. I, I would agree with you. I mean, he, he, nobody worked, and that's where the jealousy came in with the players that didn't want right. to put the time in, and uh, he demanded perfection. So right. I say I can find players that didn't want to play with him, but tell me a coach that didn't want to coach him. Of course. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with former National College Basketball Coach of the Year, Larry Eustacey. I believe you're 51 on the all-time wins list uh, in college basketball wins, which is incredible when you think of all the coaches uh, over the course of the last, what, 70, 80 years. It's unbelievable. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about controversy. You alluded to it a little bit. You've had your share. I've had mine. We all have controversy in our lives. Kobe is no exception to that. But I'm going to tell you, Larry, I have a problem with certain people uh, in the last couple days that are talking about Kobe Bryant, that are calling him a rapist. We have audio of a teacher that, uh, you know, that that's called him a rapist in the classroom. First of all, those charges were dropped. So he's not a rapist. That's not factually accurate. Number two. Yes. Did he commit adultery? He admitted to that. And I think in the last 17 years old. Uh, 17 years, he's, he paid the price for it, and I think he made amends with his family, and that was a personal issue. What do you make of some of these people just days after he dies and he loses his thir- the 13-year-old daughter, and people want to bash this guy for something that took place 17 years ago that he didn't do? Uh, th- I have a big problem with that. Those are the people that complain on Yelp. They don't have anything else to do. You know, if, if you go to your dentist and he does a great job, you're not going to write they did a great job. You got, you got crap to do. Right. These guys don't have crap to do, so they write that, you know, I, those are the, the, the – misery loves company. And those are the people that, that I've dealt with for a living for the majority of it um, yeah. from your side of it. Yeah. And they just, they just wanna, want a story and want to bring somebody down. But I go back to – the un, you know, the undressing of Kobe Bryant. How did he handle that situation? He flew there. 
Yeah. He handled it like a man. He, he flew and put 50 on people that night. Um, and I'm not taking anything <laughs> away about the incident. I, 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 you know, it was settled. Yeah. We never know what did happen, but everybody seemed to be comfortable with the situation. Yeah. He did admit adultery. Mm-hmm. And saved his marriage. He did, and 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 in in respect to what I was just talking, and I agree with you. These are yelpers. I think that's a good way to 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 talk about it. Oh, there's a, there's a reporter. With a lot of time on their hands for sure. Yeah, and there's a reporter from the Washington Post who was just suspended for talking about the rape allegation. How sick of a person do you have to be? The first moments you hear, or within 24 hours, that Kobe had lost his life. And that his 13-year-old daughter died. The first thing that went to my mind was his family, right? I'm thinking about his family and the pain they're going through. And, 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 and I get emotional uh, the last couple of days. And I'm not an extremely teary type, teared up type guy. But, like, the last couple of days I, I have been that way because I see images of his daughter, him and his daughter spending time together. I saw a video yesterday, uh, the day before Kobe died, spending time with his 3-year-old daughter at the mall. And somebody videoed it. And he's such a good dad. What type of human being are you? When your first reaction is, oh, he he, he was alleged of, of raping a girl 17 years ago. I just, I don't understand people. And by the way, there are some people in the media, like this woman from the Washington Post, who have nothing better to do. You don't want to talk about his legacy. You don't want to talk about the great things he did on and off the court. You want to talk about an allegation from 17 years ago. I just, I just don't understand. Is this the way our society is today, where you just want to hate on everybody? I just don't get it. I don't get it. I, I What do you think, J.D.? <laughs> I, I... You know, we, we talked about it yesterday. I just think that if you if you lead off with something like that, I have a huge issue with it. But if you mention it at some point during a monologue, and but mentioning how Kobe Bryant has has you know, got gotten past it and turned his life around, while mentioning the fact that you know he did admit to having consensual sex, while you know, but but Which also have, fine, having but, an affair right. or, or or cheating on his wife, so to speak, right. or committing an infidelity, but focusing on that. To me, is an issue, but I, I don't have a huge issue with mentioning it in passing and then but saying, don't but don't call him a but, rapist. But he's moved on from it, and of, right. course, and of course, he's not right. a convicted rapist. No, so I can't mean, say and, that. And, and by the way, we did mention that. We said, oh, listen, he did. had his issues right. 17 years ago. Well, how, well, how can you not? And I would also say that, sadly, probably 90%, maybe more, of former or current NBA players at one point or another have probably committed adultery. I'm not condoning it. But first of all, you're not a rapist if you do that. He was never found guilty of that crime. In fact, they dropped the charges, he paid her off. Uh, well, and, I mean, and that was it. Name a professional athlete who actually handled that situation better than Kobe Bryant did. Mike, ha- Ty- Mike Tyson didn't handle it very you well. Know, you know what I love about that? You're right. You know what I love about that press conference, Larry, if you remember it years ago, when he's sitting up on the stage with his wife, and this is right when the allegations and the charges came forward, he stood up there holding his wife's hand, and he wasn't fake, right? In this day and age, there's so many fake apologies. You know what I mean? Everybody, from politicians to athletes, whoever, they get caught, and then they apologize, and it's phony. That guy sat up there on the stage in front of the world and looked at his wife, teary-eyed, said, I'm sorry, I love you, and, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. You know, I'm going to talk about Tiger Woods for a second because I know you're a big Tiger Woods guy, and, and, and listen, what he's done on the golf course is incredible. I didn't think that press conference he did was, was – I, I just didn't think he was he – was, what's the word I'm trying to come up with here? I didn't think it was, it was genuine. I don't, think, I don't think that's Tiger, though. No, I he's just, not. I just, he's not I, in touch I, with... I, I just don't think that's who he is. I don't think he's an empath. He apologized for adultery, and then he goes to sexaholics or whatever it was called. I just think there's that there's genuine, and then there's not genuine. And and from from Kobe, from my perspective, the man was always genuine. He never said anything he didn't feel, and he was truly sorry for what he did to his family. Well, he, Kobe was a far better man than me. I mean, because you don't know how many times I've seen. Uh, Players yeah. holding their child mm-hmm. at a press conference. And the minute that camera's off, that child is handed to somebody else, and they're off running the streets. Well, Fake. that was me at times. But I always declared I was a family man. I was just, well, I wasn't at times. I mean, I'm nobody's, nobody's perfect. There's only mm-hmm. one person in my mind that's ever been perfect. But That's Brian. With that said. <laughs> I'm far with, from that. With that said, Kobe was Authentic, very genuine. I mean, he held his yeah. hand's wife after that camera was off. Right. Um, he he held his child after that camera was off them. You make and, such a good point because there are so many. I'm not going to name names, uh, <clears throat> Chris Paul, but there are so many players. <laughs> you're right that they'll they'll hold a child at a press conference. Allen Iverson did that, and then when it's all said and done, and and the cameras are off. Oh, all of a sudden they're not with their kids anymore. They give it to the nanny. Give I do think LeBron nanny. is pretty authentic with his family too. That might be true. I don't watch enough of it, but I do but know I understand you hit, what you're saying. But yeah. I, but I, I'm, 
I'm sin that way. I've talked about I'm a family guy. I've done this and then then I'm out running around drinking and stuff in in the time, in the era, and uh, so I'd be a hypocrite to talk about Allen Iverson because I was that at times right. in my life. Um, Did you ever call one of your coaches a mother effer? Uh, as he took you out of the well, game. I got, I got cut in college, so I didn't have a chance to. I didn't have a chance to mf anybody. Um, but I've, I've, uh, I've had a few confrontations on the other side of that. But no, I, I never did. But here's the thing, you know, you never put your hands on a player, right? You, you never even came never, close. Never put my hands on a player. Okay. Never threw a ball. Right. Never. What What I'd like to say I was was brutally honest, mm-hmm. and um, you know I think that's really what I mean. Coaching is parenting, and my wife always says, "Why can't you talk to your kids the way you talk to your players? Because that's the way they need to be talked to." And I'm not talking about screaming or or you know using profanity. There's a big farce, and and it's not for me to to you know. To figure myself, I'm hearing this from other people, ex-players, Marcus Pfizer. You know, yeah, who's been on if, this if, show, if yeah. you treated Marcus Pfizer, if you showed any weakness with Marcus Pfizer, and Marcus, a tough dude, he was Detroit tough. Yeah, and they so tough they had to move him to Louisiana. <laughs> um, yeah, you and know, he, to he stay out of trouble. And he lives and, here in and Vegas. And if you now. if if you were to show any weakness around yeah. Marcus. Oh, he would, he would pounce on it because that was his way. And so yeah. you had to. You could not kinder a friendship in those situations. You have to but be genuine. Look at the love now. Mm-hmm. I mean, between him and I. Yeah. I mean, we don't talk enough, but the love is there so he, genuine. He respects you. And when you were having your issues, I remember we I had a conversation with Marcus Pfizer. He goes on social media. He shows an image of you and him celebrating, I guess, when you had won the conference championship or something. And he said... Any day of the week, I'll have my kids play for Larry. That's what he said. That's respect. That's what that is. That's respect. And when you think of all the players that were successful that played for you, uh, most of them, they all they all had your back. But I would say this. You think of the Mike Krzyzewskis, the John Calipari's of the world, the Tom Izzo's. Some of those guys have been on our show. And Rick Pitino. Uh, when, when, but when you look at those that are coaching today, they didn't do anything differently than you. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, the difference is they, they had an administration that had their back. Right. That's the, yeah. And uh, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm bound to secrecy or they'll take away all the two dollars they paid me on the buyout. <laughs> um, but but that's the difference. And then once you saw, once you saw what happened with Rick, who's a very good friend of mine, he didn't have they they took out Tom Jurich, who was a high school football teammate of mine, and so Rick did not have the backing of the administration. So Rick's gone. And the difference between the other three are. They had the back end of the administration. Do you think, because I know you're close to Rick Pitino, do you think that he'll ever coach again either in the NBA or college? I think he wants to. I think he's he's content. You know, I'm helping him uh, to what degree, I don't know, but but with the Greek Olympic team. Which he's the head coach of. Yeah. Yes, and he's uh, he's enjoying coaching over in, in Greece, but I think deep down he'd love to coach in the NBA, and I think he'd be terrific. And my my say is, why just him? Why is he the one taken down? And like you just mentioned, the other guys who are great friends of mine. And I have but no it's doubt a that hypocritical. I agree. I have no doubt that Patino has made his mistakes. But at the same time, let's call it for what it is. Patino is going to go down as one of the best, if not the best, coach of all time. One of the best, certainly. I would love to see him coach again too. I think he needs to coach college. I think that's more his style. I don't think he'll ever coach college again. My opinion is he'll probably maybe get an NBA coaching job. I don't think college wants to – I don't think the NCAA I – I don't think anybody wants to touch him. There were rumors circulating that he could be the next coach here at UNLV, and I know Marvin Menzies was his former assistant and all that stuff. But you're telling me if they didn't call Rick Pitino, he wouldn't have taken this job. I think he would have taken it. Well, I know he wants I, – I, I, I agree with you. I, he he would love to get back in that setting mm-hmm. where he's a lot. I mean, he's a painter, and he and and he's let him paint. Yeah. I mean, there's been far worse done. It, it, the hypocrisy of the whole mm-hmm. academic system and the university system and the the board of trustees, and mm-hmm. I mean, it goes back to what we started talking about. Yeah, 
the Democrats and the Republicans. Yeah. I mean, there's just hypocrisy everywhere. There is. And, uh, you yeah. know, if 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 you get enough, I mean, I don't, if you get enough attention, um, like Rick's gotten, it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's tough to come back. Well, we loved having him on the show, and we'll have him on again. And, and I love Patino, and uh, I grew up a Celtics fan. I remember when he was coaching there in Boston, his famous speech. Kevin McHale's not walking through that door. Larry Bird's not walking. I, I, t- I asked him about that, and he started laughing. But very passionate guy. But, hey, but we only got a couple more minutes here left to go. Uh, for people that are unaware, uh, you call Vegas your home now. Uh, yeah, I do. So, so you've been here for, what, about a year or so maybe. What do you think of Las Vegas now that you're uh, I, a Las Vegas resident? I – I'm absolutely uh, not pleasantly surprised, but I, I love it. It's it's like no other place. And I've lived in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. It's like no other place I've ever been. It seems so unjudgmental. Like we went to, a, my wife and I went to a party with you. Um, the other and day. they're all walks of life in that party. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. all walks of life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and nobody judged anybody. Yeah. My wife had the time of her life speaking great, with, all, again, all walks. It's not like the Midwest where you have these people that are publicly pious and behind the scenes are doing some heinous things. In Vegas, you are, you are who, you, who you are. You, you are if, if, if you're a pervert, you're a pervert. If you're a drug addict, you're <laughs> right, a drug right. addict. If, you're, if, you, if all the vices well, and addictions listen. that you have, no, no one judges you, and you wear it on your sleeve. Yeah. And to me... I I'm a huge fan. I like how straightforward people are in Las Vegas compared you know, to anywhere else. The party, the party we went to, there were models, there were former strippers, there were uh, coach, AAU coaches, uh, there were uh, professional gamblers, uh, there were degenerate gamblers. That was me, by the way. I was at the party. No, but there were, there were all different types of people, you know? And you're so right. That's what I love about Las Vegas. And I will say this, and I think you'll agree with me. I like a city that gives you options. Vegas has options. If you want to live that crazy lifestyle, you can. Uh, if you want to be off the strip and, and, and have just relax and enjoy life, you can do that. Um, I can't imagine, you know, there are plenty of those options. Some of these mountain well, dude, the only, the, only, the only crap I hear is the traffic. Grow up, you people listening, grow up in Los <laughs> Angeles. Right. And this traffic is like living in Ames, Iowa compared to... Yeah. And sadly, that was Kobe Bryant's demise. Leaving right. on that, you know, Kobe. The reason why he took a helicopter was not because he wanted to brag and be lavish. Uh, right. He did it because he wanted to be on time to be at his family's events and, and, and business events, and and you know, it's why he was with his daughter. They were going to his uh, uh, Mamba Academy basketball game. But uh, we got it. We got to we got to take a twenty one hour break. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But uh, Larry, you've been a great friend to me. I appreciate um, you coming and taking some time to do this. I know you don't do a lot of this stuff but uh i appreciate you coming in man thank you well, so thank much you. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot larry it, it certainly uh, has been a, a lot of fun catching up with larry and uh, talking a little hoops and uh, tomorrow we're gonna obviously we're gonna continue to cover the impeachment trial and everything that is going on there but uh, we're gonna take a uh, 21 hour break folks and kobe's former helicopter pilot will be joining us on the show tomorrow uh so that's going to be interesting the kobe bryant's personal former helicopter pilot will be joining us tomorrow. Have a, have a great day, everybody. We'll catch you tomorrow.